Hello and welcome everyone to London. My name's Dave, I'm a Londoner. That's right, it's not Daniel Radcliffe, it's me, Dave, your London guide here this afternoon. We're just gonna wait a few minutes for others to tune in to the live digital stream before we set off around Westminster. If you're watching now, give it a like, give it a share. If you've done a tour here in London with us at Sandemans, like the video. If you've done one with me, Dave, over the last few years, give it a heart. If you've never been to London or you're planning on doing it in the future, Give the page a share. Let's get as many people involved watching the stream from the comfort of their own homes as we can. So before we start, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me. So I'm from East London, an area called Leytonstone. Not very famous to those outside London, but it is famous for David Beckham and Alfred Hitchcock. Will I be as famous as them one day? Well, share this video, you can help me get there. So I am a lover of history. That's why I love being a tour guide. My love of history was born when I was a very young boy, back in the early 90s. I went to Ireland on holiday. We went there most years, because all my family comes from Ireland. My mum and dad took me to a place called New Grange, a fascinating tomb, older than Stonehenge and the Egyptian pyramids. I stood in that tomb and I was surrounded by history. I was fascinated with the people who would have once built this. All the years that come after that event happened, what happened then as well? History is everything that has ever taken place. How can it not be interesting? So I went to university, got my degree, got my master's degree. I love to think that London is where I belong. I know the history and I really can't wait to take you around the city. Just gonna wait a little short while for more to join in. Please do share and like the video. It's really awesome getting the opportunity to do this live digital stream Sandman's tour for you here. I've uh, been looking at some of the ones the other guides have been doing around Europe. It's been really awesome. Can't wait to get started on my one. So I think we're just about ready to begin. So welcome to London. Welcome to England. Welcome to Great Britain and welcome to the UK. Now, if you've never done one of these tours before, the digital streaming aspect is a way of us getting it to you from the comfort of your home. Now, as you know, the COVID situation here in London has gone up to high. Things are looking pretty bad for our industry, but we still love what we do and we're good at it. So I really do ask if you enjoy the video, you'll see in the comments, there'll be links to a donation page. If you have any spare cash and you enjoy the video, we'd be so grateful if you could donate to this tool that I'm giving you today. But if you really don't have anything, if this COVID situation has hit you as hard as it's hit me and my fellow guides, then please, if you just share the page, that'll mean so much. We can get as many people as possible enjoying my tour today. So we begin right here in the heart of London, it's Trafalgar Square. Trafalgar Square, a famous monument to a famous battle, won by the man right up on top of Nelson's column, Horatio Nelson. Vital in the Battle of Trafalgar on board the HMS Victory, seizing the victory over the combined force of the French and Spanish. The reason this battle is so famous is because this land has not been conquered in nearly a thousand years. Why? Because this land is an island. That's why we see the influence and power of the Navy being far more important than that of the army as we go through the history. This battle and victory of Trafalgar safeguarded this land from Napoleon's invasion. And as the man who won that battle, Nelson died at the peak of his fame, like Marilyn Monroe, Jimi Hendrix, James Dean. If you die at the peak of your fame, you'll be immortalized right here. Now, if you're a lover of art, you're gonna love the building behind me. This is the National Gallery, our national collection of art here in London. If you look up here, it's a pretty enormous building, but it has very humble beginnings. Back in 1824, a banker called John Angerstein sold his collection of arts to the House of Commons and they founded the National Gallery. It was housed originally at his house in Pall Mall, which is pretty small, for such an enormous collection of art. So they decided, People are making fun about the size of our National Gallery. We need a bigger building. And in 1838, this building behind me opened up and it's been free for everyone ever since. It's exactly how it should be. So if you wanna come here to London, you can book a ticket to see this amazing art completely for free. Now, as before we go ahead into Trafalgar Square, more history about what goes on here as well. If you look over here, you'll see the glorious St. Martin in the fields first consecrated back in 1726. Now, where did that name come from? You realize when you walk around London, 
we're pretty good at naming things rather literally. St Martin in the Fields is because when it would have first been finished, it would have been surrounded by, you guessed it, fields. If it was finished these days, maybe we would have called it St Martin in the City. We're going to head on down into Trafalgar Square now. Now Trafalgar Square is a famous place of gathering here in London. We're talking about religious celebration. Christmas celebration is here, Easter, Hanukkah, Chinese New Year. But it's not just people gathering together to celebrate. People often gather here in Trafalgar Square to protest, to demonstrate, to make their voices heard. So if you look back through history, all the most famous demonstrations going from apartheid to the um, Extinction Rebellion movement, they all take place right here. It's a focal point of these demonstrations in London. And it's obviously why the police want to make sure they keep an eye on things, make sure that things don't spill out of control. It's often thought that that's why. If we look over here, the fountains were put into Trafalgar Square, thought to make the square smaller so less people could actually come and gather if they wanted to complain about the parliament and the palace. So how are they going to keep an eye out for what's going on here during these demonstrations? They're going to need a police station. They're probably going to need a lookout post. Well, it's often known as the smallest police station in the entire city. And no one really knows where it is because it's so small, but it is right over here. It's absolutely tiny, isn't it? The smallest police station in the entire city. Although really, it's just a lookout post. Now, here in Trafalgar Square, we've got many plinths. Some of them are quite traditional. Statues of King George IV. Henry Havelock, Charles Napier, political military men. But my favourite plinth here in Trafalgar Square is known as the fourth plinth. It originally kept empty because of King William IV's statue on a horse was supposed to be placed on the fourth plinth, but they eventually ran out of money. So back in 1994, a conversation was started to put something on the plinth and they decided to open it up as an art competition. And if you look all the way over in the far corner, Look at that. That doesn't really look like a statue of a king on a horse, does it? That is a piece called The End. An artist called Heather Philipson made that. It's around nine tons in height. It's supposed to be a sort of a comment on today's society. The grotesque extravagance of the cream dripping over the side of the plinth. But most of us Londoners believe this art competition is not going to last forever. We think we're saving that for a permanent statue of the Queen when she dies, if she dies. So if you look up here at the very base of Nelson's column, you'll see these enormous reliefs. They celebrate Nelson's four most famous victories and thought to be casted of the actual cannons captured from the Battle of Trafalgar itself. Now, we're gonna head on down Whitehall shortly. We're also gonna see the Admiralty, and the Horse Guards Parade, heading off to Westminster Abbey and Parliament. But before we get there, some of my favourite pieces of Trafalgar Square. Isn't it glorious? These are the famous lions. These were designed by a man called Edwin Landseer. Originally, they were stone lions, but they were replaced and Landseer was commissioned to make these. Now, he was more of a painter than a sculptor, so he didn't know much about what a lion looks like. So if you look at the side profile of the lion, if you're an expert in wildlife, you'll realise lions don't tend to actually sit like this. They tend to have both back legs to one side. That's because the lion he used to work on had already died and was rotting away. So it's thought he based most of the model off his dog. And he does kind of look like a dog waiting for a treat, doesn't he? <laughs> We're going to go ahead and cross the road now, head on down to Whitehall. Please guys, if you're enjoying the video, share the page, share the link. Ask me some questions in the comments. Whereabouts are you from? When's the last time you came to London? Ah, here we are. If you look at the light over here, this was put here back during the Pride Festival years ago. And the Londoners loved it so much, we decided to keep it. Okay, we're crossing this road here. Oh, the famous the famous London Black Cab. We've had cabs in this country since 1654. Back then they were known as handsome cabs or hacks. 
Oh, now, the London Underground, an absolute piece of pride here in London. Why? Because we were the first city to have an underground train system. It goes back to 1863. Now, the original tunnel that was built, something of a bit of a joke between us Londoners, when the tunnel was actually dug out, it was the wrong size because they forgot to actually measure the rails that the train had to run on. <laughs> so they had to go back through the entire tunnel and make it just that little bit taller. Now, we come from Trafalgar Square, a world famous home here in London of naval battles. Now, the Royal Navy policing old empire, one of the most powerful empires in the world, that navy had to have a headquarters, the Admiralty Arch right here. This Admiralty is the HQ of the Royal Navy. And if you look closely at the very top, you'll see the Roman letters, say, in the 10th year of King Edward VII, for Queen Victoria and Grateful Citizens 1910. That 1910 is actually wrong. It should say MCMX. Small point, but us Londoners do like to be a little bit precise, don't we? Just getting ready to cross the road here. Now, some people always ask me when they come to London, Dave, why do you guys drive on the left? We say it's correct, but we do drive on the left here because of London Bridge. When London Bridge first opened for traffic, there was a big sign placed on both sides saying, pass on the left. And we've driven on the left ever since. Many believe it goes back to old medieval days of horsemen on their horses with the lance in hand. Most people's good hand is the right hand. So if you're attacking an enemy, you wanna be on his left, you'll travel past him on his left. This road here is called Whitehall. Now, Oh, the famous red double-decker bus. Isn't it absolutely glorious? This one is a little less interesting, if we're being honest, because the reason it has two decks is to just make more room for people travelling on it. So Whitehall here. This road here is named after one of the largest palaces that the world had ever seen. Sadly, it no longer exists. Burnt to the ground back in 1698. So. One, only one building of it still survives. I'll show you that shortly. So Whitehall is known as the political street here in London. It's where Downing Street is. At the other end, you have Parliament, Westminster Abbey, and lots of ministries also. But originally, the palace had around one and a half thousand rooms. It's absolutely enormous. It was bigger than the palace of the Vatican, the Pope's palace over in Rome. It wasn't quite as big as Versailles later on, but it all burnt down in 1698. A Dutch maid servant accidentally left some linens to dry by a fire. They caught fire. The whole palace burnt down, sadly. Now, only one building still survives. Look at these glorious architectural buildings here. Going back to the Georgian red brick, the lovely Greek revival columns as well. And right here, a famous landmark of London. It is, of course, the K6. We all call them phone boxes, but it's actually called the K6 because it's the sixth design of the telephone kiosk, designed by a man called Sir Giles Scott. The reason they're red is quite simply to make them easy to see, pretty much, <laughs> that's why. So London itself, where does that name come from? It comes from the Romans. They first came here in the year 43 to bring it into the kingdom. It wasn't Caesar, he just raided Britannia. The fourth emperor, Claudius, he actually brings it into the Roman Empire. Londinium is settled on the north bank of the River Thames. So where we are now is not technically the city of London. This is the city of Westminster. It's much larger, there's more people, there's more buildings. So where does Westminster come from? It comes from one building. We'll be seeing it towards the end of the tour. It is, of course, Westminster Abbey. It's a royal peculiar church, we still call it an abbey because in this country, tradition above all else, right? So Westminster literally just means the church to the west. We are all here to the west of the city of London. The one famous landmark back then would have been, of course, the abbey, the seat of coronation and power. Now, Whitehall Palace here was one of the central places where Henry VIII would govern his kingdom. 
It wasn't originally his, it was that of his favourite Cardinal Wolsey. After his fall from power, Henry VIII seized the palace, as well as completely changing the religion in this country. The reason why the Queen today is the head of the church is because of Henry VIII. The Act of Supremacy in 1534 got rid of the power connection with Rome and created the King or Queen of England as head of the church. So the Queen is still head of the church today making this country a strange fusion of monarchy, democracy, and also theocracy as well. Now, we're about to approach the official entrance to Buckingham Palace and St. James's Palace. That's quite a way away from those palaces. The official entrance is, of course, marked by the sentries, the horse guards, which is why this area is called horse guards. Look over here, you'll see them standing on the horse there. These horses are known as Irish black horses because Charles II thought they were very tall and powerful. On the horse you'll see the lifeguards, famous for their gorgeous scarlet tunics guarding the front of the sentry. We'll talk a bit more about them shortly. And if we look across the road over here, you'll see the last surviving building that survived the fire of Whitehall Palace back in 1698. It's called the Banqueting House. From that window in the bottom left of the frame here, that is where Charles I stepped out to have his head cut off back in 1649. So pretty, pretty important building here in London. We're gonna head through here over there now. Yes, the sign is right to warn you to beware because if you do get too close to the horses, they can bite. Now these guys also stay in the barracks here right here in the court of horse, yard, horse guards it's one of my favorite london traditions so that's a pretty interesting story behind it it's known by many londoners as the punishment parade so back in 1894 queen victoria had heard a pretty bad story she heard that these men were at work and while they should be on duty they were drunk and they were gambling she decided this is not good enough not for my horse guards so i'm going to go down one day and inspect them she chose to do that at four o'clock she discovered to her horror that they were drunk and gambling. So she decided, I'm going to go down and inspect them. She did that, she found it out and decided, I'm going to do that every single day. Four o'clock, every single day, these men would be, um, they'd be examined, they'd be um, the punishment parade, they'd be inspected. She said, for the next hundred years, this needs to happen. So 1894 to 1994. A hundred years later, it's over. But the Queen, our Queen, decided we love this tradition so much, we're going to go ahead and keep it. So that's why still to this day, the, these guards are inspected every day at four o'clock. Because over a century ago, those horse guards were drunk and gambling. And that's not good enough for Queen Victoria. As you see, we've just entered into a pretty spectacular area known as Horse Guards Parade. This is most famous for being where the Queen celebrates her official birthday every year. Now, the Queen's official birthday is not the same. <laughs> Always good to see some nice dancing in front of horse guards. The Queen's birthday is not the same as her actual birthday, of course. That's the 21st of April. So why does the Queen have two birthdays? It's quite simple, really. She needs to celebrate her birthday when it's warm. So this tradition was first started by George II back in 1748. Basically, the king or queen inspects the guards and the soldiers right here on Horse Guards Parade. Make sure they are good enough. So why not combine it with the celebration of the sovereign's birthday? Now, it would happen on the sovereign's actual birthday, but when you are born in the summer, it's already warm. As the queen is not born in the summer, she has two birthdays. It's 21st of April, a little too cold here in London. So she does it on the second Saturday of June every year. Over here, you'll see the Admiralty House. Once the home of the Lord High of the Admiralty, the political figurehead of the Navy, like many things in modern day London, it's been sold by the government to a hotel chain. So yay, capitalism. If you look just to the left of it, you'll see the Admiralty Citadel. This was built very hastily back in the Second World War. 
The idea being that if the enemy tanks had rumbled here into Westminster and Whitehall, this would be where the last stand of defence was to take place. So the gun placements poking out the side, the heavily built up walls, but of course it was never needed. So after the war, there was a question, what do we do with it? Well, it's listed now, and a listed building in London means you are not allowed to get rid of it. So all they can do is just cover it in ivy and then hope it doesn't look as ugly. Churchill hated it, he said it was a gross concrete monstrosity. As we walk across the glorious road here in uh, Horse Guards, as we see across the road, we see St James's Park. This is London's first ever royal park. It's 54 acres, which might not seem very big. Hyde Park is around 350. But this is one of Londoners, one of many Londoners favorite parks because of the amazing bird life that we have in here. We've got everything from coots, swans, pelicans, a couple of pigeons, but they're everywhere in London. So this was originally the idea all the way back of Charles II. He's restored to the throne in the 17th century, and he spent a lot of his exile during the years of Cromwell and the Republic in France. So he fell in love with all things French, the food, the fashion, the parks, or as they say in France, the jardins. So he wants a French style park right here in London. This is his idea. Now, if you were coming to visit Charles II restored to the throne, it's pretty difficult to buy a gift for a king. Kings tend to have everything already, so people would give him exotic animals that'd be kept right here in the park. The pelicans were originally given to him back in 1664 by the Russian ambassador, so we've always had pelicans here ever since, which is pretty cool. Now, if we look just over here, you'll see the back garden of 10 Downing Street. If you were to scale that wall, you could be having tea with Boris Johnson. Have a quick word with him about how he's managing this COVID situation, shall we? <laughs> so this goes back to 1735. Back then, George II wasn't too happy that this Sir Robert Walpole man, the first Lord of the Treasurer, effectively known today as the first Prime Minister, he's going to be a very powerful man. And George II thought, well, I'm the king. Well, he's not going to have a nicer house than me, which is why 10 Downing Street is so ordinary looking, for the simple reason that it is not a palace. It's that simple, really. Oh, a glorious park. Have you ever been to St. James's Park? Write in the comments, what's your favorite London park? Richmond Park is famous for its deers, much more rough and rugged as well. Um, Hyde Park, famous for concerts, really. They're all owned by the, uh... oh, there's a squirrel. Oh, we've just lost him. They look like Albert, that's a local. Oh, there he runs off. I can't give you any nuts, I'm doing a tour always bothering me for nuts isn't he? So I'll say my favourite park, probably Victoria Park over in Hackney. But um, put in the comments what do you like, share the video, like the video if you're enjoying the tour. We're going to head on this way up now. The building behind me is called the Foreign Office. These are ministerial buildings here in Whitehall. But we're approaching an area that you can't actually see but has a very very important role to play in 20th century London. So during the Second World War, all of these would have been pretty well bombed a lot, a lot of the time. Not as badly as East London. The reason why East London had such a terrible blitz during the Second World War is because that's where the factories were, that's where the workers were, the women making the bullets and the guns. So if you wanted to concentrate your bombs to destroy Britain's war effort, you choose East London. But it didn't mean these areas here weren't also attacked. Buckingham Palace, for example, was bombed nine times in the conflict. But the government, first of all headed by Neville Chamberlain, then later, of course, Winston Churchill, decided we need a bunker here in London to conduct the war. It's very important that the public can't think that we've abandoned them, because if they think that, then they're not going to have any faith in us. They're going to lose their morale for the war. So it's decided a bunker will be built right here in Westminster, underneath the Treasury. No one knew it was there at the time. It was completely top secret. If you were anything from a cleaner to a typist, you would be given a very strict, very detailed story of what you are to tell your friends and family, what you're doing every day. Really, they were working in the bunker. Only three meters of concrete protected it. So had it actually been bombed, it wouldn't have actually survived the blow, which is pretty bad. Uh, Hitler's bunker over in Berlin was much better protected, but it was never actually hit. But it was once evacuated. Now I used to volunteer here, so this is a story passed down to me from the managers. They said one night during the Blitz, Winston Churchill stood up here on the roof of the treasury. 
looking down the line of the River Thames to where the Blitz was raining down on East London. He then decided, I'm going to warm myself up a little bit. So what does he do? He sits on a chimney. After sitting on that chimney, the smoke backs up into the bunker. You can see the entrance just over here. Everyone in the bunker is evacuated in a panic. And Churchill knew absolutely nothing about it. If you ever visit the Churchill War Rooms, which I highly recommend you do, if you have any interest in the Second World War or Churchill himself, one of my favorite rooms is this big steel room called Toilet. It was not the toilet. It was the top secret telephone line from Churchill directly to Roosevelt all the way over in the White House. They would also have a weather warning as you go down and wherever there were bombs dropping above head in London, it would say windy, something of a joke amongst the Londoners. Now, people often ask me, where does the term England come from? Where does Great Britain come from? What about United Kingdom? Where are those terms from? Well, it's pretty interesting. Every name has an origin, and something as a tour guide comes up pretty often. So first of all, the United Kingdom. What's that all about? Quite simply, this is not just one kingdom. There's many kingdoms united. That's exactly why. So the Kingdom of England, the Kingdom of Scotland, they were once separate powers. So all the way through the centuries, usually at war with each other, until 1603. So in that year, King James I becomes that of England, having already been King James VI of Scotland. So the same man rules both kingdoms, but he didn't unite them. So over a century later, Queen Anne did that. So the United Kingdom, or UK, literally means the combined kingdoms of England and Scotland. So what about Great Britain? When someone says British, what does that mean? Great Britain is simply the name of the island that I'm standing on right now, the largest island in all Europe. Great Britain meaning all the Britons together, including the regions of northern France, known as Breton or Brittany. So what about England? Where does that come from? It comes from the German tribe called the Angles. You ever heard of the Anglo-Saxons? Same people. So they come here following after the Romans leave. The land of the Angles, quite simply the Angle land, or Ingerland, of course. That's where that comes from. Oh. Oh, there's Donald Trump on his bike. There we are. You do have to be careful cycling in London. There are more double-decker buses than cyclists, so you do have to look after yourself. There we go. We are just approaching the political centre here in London, so it's not surprising we see uh, him over there, is it? Now, heading up now towards Westminster Abbey and the Houses of Parliament. Now, these are very famous structures. They are UNESCO World Heritage Structures. There's only actually four UNESCO Heritage Structures or places in London. Such a famous, enormous city, many people think there has to be more. It's only the Tower of London, Kew Gardens, Maritime Greenwich, and Westminster Abbey in Parliament. So centuries ago, back during the reign of Edward the Confessor, we're talking a thousand years ago, this was all just an island, it's very swampy. He decided to build his palace and church here, centralize his power. A fusion of the kingdom as the monarchy, the state, people, and the church. Back then, before the Act of Supremacy, the Catholic Church was the absolute ruling power here. The Pope, of course, having all the cards in his hand back then during the medieval years. So Edward the Confessor centralizes power here. And this is where all the famous events of Parliament, the Abbey, coronation, weddings, it's where they all happen. Now, all these symbols are very famous. What I'm about to show you now is the actual coat of arms of the United Kingdom. It also includes the royal standard. That's the flag that flies wherever the queen goes, full of heraldic symbols. And it's quite confusing, but if you look at the history behind it, it all makes perfect sense. So if we look just over here, the coat of arms of the United Kingdom. We see the lion and the unicorn, the lion representing the Kingdom of England, the unicorn that of Scotland. The writing you see is not Latin, it's French. Duet mon droit means God and my right. That's about the divine right that God gives to kings and queens to rule this kingdom. The shield in the middle is also the royal standard as well. So the three lions representing the Kingdom of England, the proud lion, the Scottish Kingdom, and the harp, Kingdom of Ireland. Now, Ireland is no longer part of the United Kingdom. 
but because Northern Ireland still is. That's why the harp is still here. Although the government in Dublin, they do not like it. <laughs> We're gonna head this way now, over before we talk about Parliament Square and a little bit about Westminster Abbey as well. As we see more phone boxes over here as well. This is where back in the past, the politicians and the journalists would queue up to make sure they could get the story from St. Stephen's or Parliament back to the news desk. These days though, there are still queues, but they're usually for selfies. <laughs> my favorite selfie I say to my tourist guests, I just say, lean against it and get your mobile out. Something of an ironic picture, if you like. Oh, glorious bagpipes in the background, the sounds of London. So if we look over here in the distance, very, very famous structure. I do apologize for the way it looks, but in our defense, we do have to look after it, make sure it doesn't become London's newest bridge. All around London would say, that's Big Ben. It is not Big Ben. That is actually called the Elizabeth Tower. Big Ben comes from the bell that's inside that tower. It's called the Great Bell. Big Ben, just the nickname. So you don't see Big Ben, you hear Big Ben. Now this was built following the Great Fire of 1834. Parliament burns to the ground. Fire is something of a pretty famous theme here in London. So the new Gothic Revival Palace of Westminster is built with the two new towers, the Clock Tower and the King's Tower. It takes its name from a man called Benjamin Hall. He was the commissioner of the works, known to be quite a tall and large man. So his nickname, of course, Big Ben, which is why we call this Big Ben sometimes. So we're gonna head over now into Parliament Square do always look out for the green man folks we have to make sure there's no injuries no one's ever been injured on my tour it's a record I'm proud of let's keep it that way ah, so Parliament this is the seat of political power here in the United Kingdom look over here the side closest to us that's the only bit that survived the fire back of 1834 it's known as a gothic masterpiece here in London. So it makes sense that the part of the palace that was built following the fire is gothic also, gothic revival. Look over here. Oh. Isn't it just incredible? So we have the Elizabeth Tower and all the way over there, the Victoria Tower, named after our two longest serving sovereigns. Of course, our current Queen Elizabeth II and Queen Victoria. Now the Queen does have a pretty important role to play here at Parliament. Quite simply, Parliament, which is the House of Commons and the House of Lords, they can't do anything unless the Queen opens Parliament officially at the state opening, which means she has to come here. Now when she does, as a royal, she is forbidden from entering the House of Commons. So she has to send down someone called Sarah Clark, the Lady Usher of the Black Rod, to do it for her. <laughs> so she comes and summons the House of Commons the House of Commons come and meet in the House of Lords. The Queen then gives her speech, telling them Parliament is open and then goes back to the palace. Now, all the laws that are discussed here at Parliament, people always ask me, what role does the Queen have to play in them? Quite simply, the Queen can veto anything that comes through Parliament. People always tell me, well, Dave, the Queen of England has no real power. She can veto anything that comes through this house but has never done so. Though she has that power, she does not use it. The last person to use it was Queen Anne around three centuries ago, when she said, I don't want a militia based in Scotland. The Queen would never do that. She realizes that if she did use that power, the public sentiment of positivity towards the royal family would slowly fade away and people would start thinking about Republic again. Now over here, our final stop, it's of course the glorious Westminster Abbey. The original Benedictine monastery were here over a thousand years ago. What we see here is the more recent 13th century building built during the reign of Henry III. Look at the glorious Gothic structure, the flying buttresses. This is of course most famous for coronation. All the kings and queens going back towards the 11th century coronated right here at Westminster Abbey most recently being the Queen in 1953. That was a first ever televised coronation. I often joke that the next coronation of Charles, that will be the first ever live streamed on YouTube coronation. All takes place right here within the Abbey's walls. The royal coronations, as well as the royal weddings. 
This is where the Queen and Prince Philip were wed. It's also where Prince William and Kate Middleton were wed, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Most Londoners remember that day very well because we all got a day off work and that's what we like. Love the royals, days off work, also pretty good as well. The so royal coronation, royal weddings, royal burials as well. There are many monarchs laying here. It was once known as the House of Kings, but it also has the burial of Elizabeth I and Mary I. First two queens of England also here. Not just famous royals lay here though, famous Britons as well. Everyone from Chaucer, Dickens, Newton, Darwin. Pretty fascinating that the man who uh, talked about how we'd evolved from animals is laid in what is actually a church. It's also the tomb of the unknown soldier. A soldier dug up from the terrible trenches and devastation of the First World War. Though we don't know his name, he lays alongside kings and queens right here in the Abbey. If you've never been, I highly recommend it. It's a fascinating building, not to mention all the history that goes on within it. And of course, the burials. Probably the most impressive is Edward the Confessor. He died nearly a thousand years ago and was canonized as saint of the Catholic Church which is why all the kings and queens that followed wanted to be as close to him as possible. He's the cool one. And just as we before, before we arrive at our last stop, right in front of the glorious abbey, see the Nicholas Hawksmoor Towers. As Big Ben showed you the other day, St. Paul's Cathedral, the enormously impressive structure there in the city of London, designed by Christopher Wren, of course, one of our other favorite architects, Nicholas Hawksmoor. He leaves his stamp right here on the abbey. Although sadly, he never lived to see it be completed. If you look up here at these glorious towers, these were designed by him and finished all the way back in 1745. Sadly, didn't live to see its completion, but a glorious face to the front of just an incredible structure. If you would like to come here and take mass, do check out the restrictions, but you can come and see it. It is still a functioning church after all of these centuries. Evensong here is probably one of my favorite things to do in London, just taking the history, taking the sound. That's what you're really here for, seeing these structures, understanding why they're so famous, understanding why us tour guides absolutely love talking about them. We're almost just about out of time, guys, but it's been a really awesome time leading you around my city, telling you some of the stories, some of the history. Please do like and share the video. And as I did mention at the very start, if you really did enjoy the tour and you're feeling kind enough to give a donation to us here at Sandermans, the link is right here in the comments. If you did enjoy it and you can afford, I know these times have been tough, they've been tough for me as well. If you can, be so appreciated as well. Also do like and share the video. Uh, my name is Dave. It's been really great fun taking you around the city and um, I'll look to see you next time. Take care. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. <laughs>